All right. If you'll take your Bibles out, please open them to the book of Hebrews <laughs> as we uh, return to this book where we have spent so much time and we are nowhere near finished. Hebrews chapter 7, if you will join me in standing out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. Um, we come to, again, we'll start at verse 14 and read through verse 16, focusing our attention this morning on verses 14 and 15. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. It is far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has, not, who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would give us grace to understand, Father. Give us courage to speak truth and to contend for truth even in the face of tradition and opposition. Give us courage, Father, to speak your truth regardless of what those who hear think or want to hear. God, let us never be guilty of being silenced out of fear of the audience. God, we just pray for your mercy in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> So we've been dealing with this passage and dealing with the book of Hebrews now for years. Um, and I want to explore this morning the structure of an idea. We're, we're going to kind of step back from um, the, the mechanics of, of what is, is being taught about Christ in particular just for this morning. And I want to look at this whole section that we've read and understand that the writer of Hebrews builds a very nuanced argument and that the fact that he has constructed it in this way teaches us all by itself that there is something important in its content. That the manner in which the sentence is constructed demonstrates that the writer is showing something of extreme importance. And the words that he uses and the pugnacious manner in which he continues to press the obvious minutia is itself instructive. He doggedly pursues the case that Christ is different and that Christ is superior and that the differences that Christ manifests from what has gone before are the very reason why his audience should understand. He has not let this line of reasoning go. We've been dealing with Melchizedek and Christ's priesthood in Melchizedek and the replacement of the priesthood now for a chapter and a half, and he's not done yet. But he's not beating the same horse in the same fashion. He's talking about how not only have we already established that Christ is superior, but that the superiority of Christ implies that the old priesthood must be put aside. He has a completely different focus on this idea. And we'll explore that idea more fully next time. But what really struck me this morning as I was thinking about this is that it is important to note the writer's willingness to defend the truth to challenge the status quo, and to even appear argumentative for the sake of truth, regardless of what is the generally accepted line of understanding. Now, I want you to see this in the structure. So look again at verse 13. He says, it is evident, it is evident that, I'm sorry, verse 14, it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. So he's already made this case, right? He's already established that Christ is from a new tribe, and that he has arisen from Judah, this has already been established. And he said, look, this is already evident. I've already shown you this. And I have something else to show you. He says, it is evident that Christ arose from Judah. And then verse 15, he says, and it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. So he's saying, the things that I've been trying to tell you is evident in the fact that Christ has arisen from Judah, and it is even more evident because he is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He just keeps hammering it over and over and over. This idea of evident, um, it means manifest, it means unarguable, it means obvious. He's, he's telling them, and the word choice that he's using in the Greek here, it's, it's pretty in your face. He's saying, look, you guys are silly, you're not paying attention. This, this can't be argued. Christ is, is not out of the order of Levi. 
And he says because of that, and because he is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, it is even more evident, it is more manifest, it is more unarguable, more obvious that this new priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, means that the rules have been changed. Now, the common wisdom among many in the church today is that we should never be seen as combative. That a willingness to be dogmatic and clear on the details of what God has said is just too mean-spirited. And there is a generalized push to silence the clear and powerful teaching of the Word of God. Many in the church say live and let live. It's the reigning motto of the era. And the acceptance of all ideas and inclusion of every perversion is man's way of just getting along and often trying to get ahead. But beloved, God has spoken. And we are obligated to declare His Word and not man's. And sometimes that means being argumentative. Sometimes that means being pugnacious. Sometimes that means telling the world, look, you tell me what you think, and I don't care. I'll tell you what God says. And I'm not willing to play your games, and I'm not willing to use your pronouns, and I'm not willing to argue these things on your ground. I will tell you what God has said, end of the story. And the problem is, is that so many people in the church are afraid to do that because of the consequences that might arise in the world. But let me ask this question before we go any further. Are you more afraid of the consequences of the world? Or are you more afraid of the consequences that might come from God? Because in the end, there are going to be consequences. One way or the other. No action is without its consequence. No action is without its payment. And in the end, we have to make a decision in our own lives about which one we fear more. Do we fear God? Or do we fear man? Here's the scope of what we're looking at. Truth is always under assault. Do you understand that? Every single day, in every single circumstance, in everything that is going on, Satan is always attacking the truth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. It's a fairly familiar passage, at least in parts. I hear people quote one verse or another out of it often. But I, I want to read you the, the passage here, beginning at verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, yes, all of you. Be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Peter starts off saying, submit to God, pay attention to what God has to say, pay attention to God's hand on you, cast yourself upon him. And he says, because, that word for means because, cast yourself upon God because your adversary, the devil, is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is always looking to destroy the church, always looking to destroy the people of God, always seeking to do harm wherever he may. And this is not just because of us but because of the truth that we proclaim. Do you want to know how to keep Satan out of your life? Don't speak truth. Right? Be quiet on matters that matter. Lay down for what the culture says you're supposed to do. Go along to get along. And I promise you, Satan won't have any problem with you, and he will leave you alone. And if all you want is to be left alone by the enemy, then there's your course. Now, again, if you belong to God, he won't leave you alone if you try that. <laughs> but you see, what, what Peter is telling us is that we have to trust God 
and cast ourselves upon him because our enemy is always seeking to attack. Now, he's agile in his attacks. He will, he will faint one way and attack another. He will always shift his focus from one front to the next with hardly a pause. He will attack to gay what seemed to be ignored yesterday, and he will ignore tomorrow what he sought to destroy today. The problem that we have often is that we get so focused on his attacks that we lose sight of where we're supposed to be putting our faith and our trust. The attacks are going to come. There's no way around that. So if you fix your eyes on God and submit to him, God will do the protecting. And that's why Peter bookended this whole thing with God. He said, cast yourself upon him and understand that when the trials and tribulations come, God will exalt you in the end. And in the middle of that is the verse that everybody talks about. And they say it as if it's our job to protect ourselves from Satan. Do you understand that's missing the boat completely? If, if all you do is quote verse 8, your adversary, the roaring lion, right? Just guard, be on your guard against him. Pay attention. That, that misses the whole point of what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, cast yourself upon God because the enemy will eat you. And God will protect you. And if God allows him to have a bite or two out of your hide, then God will restore you at the end. And it's completely up to God. But our confidence lies not in us, but in our God. Our confidence lies in what God tells us to do. And this will empower us to speak truth when truth is under assault. Because remember this, you are not the target. The truth that you proclaim is the target. What Satan wants to silence is the truth about Christ. What Satan wants to silence is the truth that God is exactly who he says he is. And this is the ground on which he will attack, always to undermine our faith in God so that the church becomes more aware of the attacks than the God who we uphold. Our responsibility is to hold high the glory of Christ and to give no mind to what's coming at us from what the enemy is trying to do. Our responsibility is to be faithful to our God and not yield to the pressure of the world. The place of defense will become the ground of persecution. You understand that? The place that you stand on truth and the place where you say, this far and no further, I will stand for my God, it will become the very ground of your persecution. And if you are not resting in God and not trusting in what he is telling you to do, then when the enemy comes against you, you're going to back up and yield. You're going to say, you know what, you're right. I, I shouldn't have put it so bluntly. I shouldn't have been so mean-spirited. I shouldn't have said that. I, I'm really sorry if I offended you. Now, now please hear me. I'm not giving you license to be cruel. Okay? We don't have to be mean. But we do have to be honest. And if our honesty offends somebody, I'm sorry. Well, not really. I'm sorry they're offended. But I'm not sorry I said it. I need to be careful about how and why. There is always in this a danger of saying something just because I know I'm right. And I like being right. Who doesn't? <laughs> there, there's always a danger that it's going to be arrogant and self-centered and self-driven. You have to be on your guard for that. That's one of the ways the enemy might attack. But, but it's important that you recognize the truth. That you stepping into the line of fire means somebody's going to shoot at you. It seems obvious to have to say it. But oftentimes, Christians tend to think that, hey, I, I shouldn't be getting attacked. I'm doing what's right. That's exactly why you'll be attacked. That's exactly why the enemy comes against you, because you're doing what's right, because you're speaking what's true. So don't let it silence you. Go in with your eyes open. Go in being aware of what's going on around you. Situational awareness. Head on a swivel. Pay attention to what's going on. But understand that doing the right thing does not protect you from attack. It guarantees it. Beloved, if you're not being attacked on some front, you're probably not doing anything for the I don't know what to say. If your life is completely perfect and you are not under assault on some front or another, there is a problem with how you're following God. Because God promises persecution. He promises that the ground that we defend becomes the place of obedience. Because in that defense and in that persecution, God tries our patience and refines it. 
In that place of defense and in that place of persecution, God refines our obedience. He tests us and makes sure that we are willing to obey and teaches us to obey even when nothing else makes sense. And he will also refine our patience. And he will grant to us faith that grows and grows. All of these things come out of persecution. They come out of us standing for what is true and defending the truth against all assaults. Now, in order to defend the truth, you have to first understand the truth. So there's a little bit of homework that you have to do. It's called reading your Bible and praying and spending time with God. You can consider that your daily assignment. You can consider that arming for war. That's why Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 6 about putting on the whole armor of God. That's, that's not just a helpful passage. That's a daily exercise. Pray through the armor. Ask God to give you the grace to put on each piece. And to walk in the grace and the truth that he gives to you. Listen to how Paul describes it in 2 Timothy. Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1. He says, hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me. In faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, the good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Or in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, he says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scripture, might have hope. You want to ask why God wrote His Word down? Boy, here's a promise. Whatever was written down was written for you. It was written for our learning, so that we might know who He is, so that, through the patience and comforts of the Scripture, we might be granted hope. Do you feel hopeless in your life? If you do, let me tell you the truth. You need to get into the Word. I don't care how much you're in it. I don't care if you're reading 20 hours a day. If you're still feeling hopeless, you need to go for 21. Amen? Amen. The answer to hopelessness is God himself. It is the promise of God granted through Scripture. Here's where we find hope. We find hope in what he has said. This means that we have to be fluent with the word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 16, says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Look. <clears throat> We need to be aware of the trends and patterns that are coming against the church from the world. We need to have our eyes open to what's going on around us so that we know how to apply the word to those situations. But we need to be experts in the word of God. We need to be a focused people that the word is our everything. It is our go-to. It is our reason. It is our answer. It is our commission. It is our power. It is our weapon. It is our defense. It is everything that we need. If we are not a people of the word, we are running into battle absolutely unarmed and defenseless in every conceivable way. And it requires us to be faithful to seek God in everything he is and to be obedient to his commands. We do need to understand what's coming against us. In Paul's day, it was the Judaizers. Those who said that in order to be a good Christian, you have to first become a good Jew. They sought to shackle the church back under the bonds of slavery that the law was. In spite of the fact that God had made it very plain that they were delivered. In John's sphere, it was the Gnostics, dispensers of secret knowledge that didn't come from God. These, these hidden words that God himself did not say. It wasn't consistent with the given word of God. And it included many false ideas about Jesus. It included on one gamut the idea that Jesus was pure spirit, didn't have a body, so the resurrection was a falsehood. And on the other side, it, it dealt with Jesus not being God, that he was just a really wise man. All of these things are false, and they're things that John specifically addressed in his writing. In the realm of the early church and the spread of the church, we find men like Simon the sorcerer, who sought to buy and sell the gifts of God. He was rebuked sternly by the apostles. And then there were always men like Alexander the coppersmith, who Paul says did him much harm. And he warned Timothy to beware of him, for he greatly resisted the word of truth. 
You see, we have to be willing to engage in the conversation between the word and the world. And we need to understand that all around us, the world is seeking to silence the word. We need to understand that all around us, the world is seeking to acknowledge its own preferences as supreme. But that God has told us his word is what stands forever. It's not about your preference. It's not about stylistic decisions. It's not about what songs we sing in church. It's not about whether or not you raise your hands or don't raise your hands. It's not about any of the things that we want to get distracted by. What it is about is do we stand upon the word of God or do we stand upon our own preferences and ideas? At the bottom of it, that is the dividing line. The world will always choose self. The world will always choose my ideas, my preferences, my opinions. Now, where we get confused is occasionally you will find somebody who says, I desire this and I'm going to do this thing. And we'll look at the thing itself and say, that's a good thing. What's the problem? Right? I want to go to Africa and start a medical mission. I don't want to have anything to do with Christ. I just want to go help people get well. Well, that's a noble aim, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe. What's your motive? What's your intention? Who are you glorifying? See, we need to call to attention those things that are actually going on. We need to call to attention the motives that are underneath it because what is worldly might look good to us, and if we're not aware of what's going on, we're going to get sucked into something we have no business participating in. We need to be conscious of this. It is always a battle between the word and the world. It's not about our style. It's about content and it is about truth. And there is one question, one question only. What does the word of God say about the matter at hand? Period. That's the only question that matters. Because God has spoken to every single thing that we need to be mindful of. And at the point that we veer the discussion off into our preferences or our ideas or our opinions, we have lost the only ground that is defensible. Does that make sense? We have to be just hyper vigilant about staying focused on the word as central to everything that's going on. And that's why the writer of Hebrews gets so obnoxious about this. He says, look, this is evident and it's even more evident and it's even more evident. And you need to understand this is evident. He just doesn't stop. And he's been on this for a while. He continues to speak about Christ and the order of Melchizedek and replacing the priesthood and all the things that he's saying. He just keeps coming around and around and around. You ever have somebody say, look, I've heard it. Shut up. If you've ever spoken, I'm sure you have, whether they've heard it or not. <laughs> Don't let that put you off. Continue to speak the truth. Because in the end, if we will not speak the truth, we are not doing what we're called to do. The church's job and your job is to stand firm on the word of God and to proclaim the word of God faithfully according to what he says and not according to what we desire. Now, if we're doing this at all, you don't have to be completely on top of everything to understand that what you're probably going to be doing is having a fight. <laughs> and you have to be willing to fight for the truth. You have to be willing to stand up for what is real and what is right and what is true and proclaim the truth even against everything else that is fighting against you. And sometimes to fight for the truth is to press its advance against old ideas. For instance, Galatians chapter 2 Starting at verse 3, Paul writes this, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. This occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us again into bondage. What's he talking about? He's talking about the work of the Judaizers. He's talking about those who sought to enslave the church back to the Old Testament law. Now, you might think to yourself, this is dead and gone. Nobody's doing that anymore. I promise you. 
hear people talking lately about, hey, we need to go back to the biblical pattern of eating that was given to us in Genesis, and we need to only eat this. Or if they want to expand it just a little bit more, they'll say, you really shouldn't be having that bacon. You shouldn't be having that pork. You shouldn't be eating anything that God declared to be unclean because God said it was unclean. Never mind the fact that God later told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Right? But why do they do it? They do it because they want to enslave you to the law. They want to enslave you to something that you can do, and by doing something, you think that you are buying favor with God. It's a bondage. It is every bit as much a bondage as those who will teach you, if you don't say this exact prayer at exactly this time, this number of times using this little toy bead set, then, then you're, you're, you're going to hell. If you don't confess your sins to this guy in that tiny little box, you're going to hell. If you don't worship when we tell you to worship, you're going to hell. Well, I would hear this. All of it is a bondage to a law made by man. It is not God's will for his people. And that, that's just a handful. You, you could just pause for just a minute and spend all day all of a sudden realizing all the places where people want to enslave you back into a bondage to some law or another. We have them in Baptist circles, too. There are churches where they'll tell you, hey, look, ladies, no pants. Gentlemen, I don't want to see any hair touching your ear. And all you guys in here that don't have a tie on, you're flat out. Go home. I've been in those churches. And obviously we're all wrong because we're using the wrong translation. I don't know what to tell you. It's a bondage to a law. And it is not derived from God's word. It is derived from the opinions and the preferences of man. And it's something that we must be willing to fight against regardless of how somebody else might feel about it. Now, sometimes we have to defend the word of God against new assaults, not just old ideas, but against new things. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. <clears throat> Many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. I want you to notice where Peter says these men come from. Among us. They come from within the church. They come from the fact that there are many in the church who will not learn the word of God, who will not stand on the truth of God, who will instead insert their own ideas and their own opinions regardless of what God's word says. And beloved, there is no shortage of those charlatans available to be seen on the internet and on television and on the radio. Now, there's no shortage of those people who will do their best to deceive the people of God because it is pleasant to them to hear the sound of their own voice. If we're going to stand for truth, it means that we often will stand alone against all who would undermine the word of God as the ground and the definition of truth. Jude, verses 3 and 4 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I find it necessary to write you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you sense a theme here? Are you beginning to understand that, that a little bit of knowledge without being anchored and grounded in the truth is a very dangerous recipe? Mm -hmm. And that God calls us to be anchored in the truth and growing in the truth and diving into his word and understanding what he has said and basing everything that we do and everything that we are upon his word and not our opinions. And what's he tell us to do? He tells us to contend for the truth once delivered to all the saints. The faith which was given to us. The truth. The body of what God has said. Contend for it. Do you, do you pay attention to how rabidly the people who hate God will proclaim and advance their causes? 
Do you understand that to them there is nothing off limits? And there is no ploy that they will not stoop to and no attack that they will not level? Do you understand that as we look at the ideas that are being bandied about, nobody cares how we feel about what they're saying? You understand that? But they demand that we care about how they feel about what we say. I'm sorry. No. I, I, I freely welcome your opportunity and your right to offend me. Go ahead. But I will stand on my right to do the same. Not meanly, not harshly, not ugly, but by simply declaring the truth of God's word without apology. By demanding that God's word be given the credit that it deserves. It is not my opinion. It is the very truth of God. And here's something I want you all to understand. When you engage in conversations with these people, if you will simply speak the word of God, pronounce truth, 99 times out of 100, the argument's over. They don't want to play with that. There is spiritual power in the truth of God's word. And they don't want to hear it. They don't want to argue with it. They, don't, they just shut them up. Speak the word of God, but don't give them your opinion. Don't tell them, well, I think. <laughs> your opinion doesn't matter any more than mine does. Opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one and they all smell. It's just something. It's just an idea. But the word of God, it is the very word of God. It is God himself speaking to us. And it will silence all opposition. I promise you, more often than not, far more often than not, if you will just quote the word, and I'm not saying you're going to win the argument, they're not going to go, oh, you're right. <laughs> but they don't want to play. And they'll walk away. They'll shut up. Because the truth is the truth. And it is incontrovertible. God's word has power to carry his will. Now, unfortunately, it also means that we often have to stand even against those who claim to be brothers to us, but who are, in fact, enemies of the truth. Look at Acts chapter 20. I want to show you something that Paul says here. Acts chapter 20. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He has been warned that he will be in, in, uh, in chained when he gets there, that he will be arrested and that he will no longer be a free man to go wherever he wants to go. Paul has determined that this is God's will for him. He's going to go. He's on his way there. He's come to Ephesus, a church that he planted, and a church that is very dear to him. And he is seeing the elders at the church at Ephesus for what he is convinced is the final time he will ever lay eyes on them as a living man. And so this is his, his final exhortation to this church that he loves. Starting at verse 25, he says, Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. What is Paul's statement? Firstly, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Why? Because I declared to you the whole counsel of God. He doesn't say, hey, look, I preached and everybody in Ephesus was saved. Why? Because it didn't happen. But he does say, I faithfully proclaimed to everyone that I spoke to the entire counsel of God, and I am thusly declared innocent of their blood. I am free of the fear and the guilt that I should have said something I didn't say. 
I spoke the truth. And then he gives the, the elders this warning. He says, look, you guys, I am entrusting this church to you. I have already entrusted this church to you. And you are those who are watching out for the church of God. And he gives this incredibly powerful connection. He says, it is the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. But God has entrusted it to us to care for, to guard, to protect, to defend. And he's telling these elders, pay attention. Because there will arise up from among you yourselves men who will seek to take away the disciples of Christ and cause them to chase after demonic things. To what does he commend them at the end? To guard their hearts so that they might in turn guard the church. What's he say? Verse 32. What is it? Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. What's he talking about? The scripture. Which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. Look, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, look, among the, even the elders, men are going to rise up. They're going to try to lead people astray. Even among those who are godly, even among those who are good, there are those who will seek to destroy the work of God. Do you think that's still going on today? Yeah. Amen. All the time, all over the place. So we have to learn to recognize the difference between those who obey God and those who don't obey God. We have to learn to understand what are the marks of his presence upon a life. Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes this, starting at verse 17. He says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk as you have us for a pattern. So pay attention to my life. For many walk of whom I have told you often and even now tell you with weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. These are harsh and condemning words. And they are words that send a chill down my spine. It's something that we have to wrestle out. And in the end, if we're going to know who we are and whose we are most effectively, we have to live for the truth that we are contending for. Make sense? It can't just be words. It can't just be, oh, I know all the right answers. I've read my Bible, and boy, howdy, can I whip you up with it. It's not how it works. We have to be willing to live what we profess. We have to be willing to do what God tells us to do. Again, in Philippians verse, chapter 1, verse 27, says, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Period. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come to see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Look, it is so important that we recognize that the power of our testimony rests on the truth of our lives. You can proclaim truth, and God can strike true with a crooked stick. But if you want a consistent witness that is going to consistently convey the truth of who Christ is faithfully according to his word, then you better be honest with yourself about the things that need to be changed in your life so that your life is a living testimony to his power and his truth. That's something we all have to engage with. It's something every single one of us has to wrestle out in the dark hours of the night according to the reality of our own souls. You know your own sin. I know my own sin. I know the things that I have to deal with, and I know the things that God is beating me about. And I understand what they are, and I fight against them. You know yours. I don't have to tell you what your sin is. You understand what it is. Whether you want to admit it or not, that's a completely different question. But I promise you, you know. Because God's Spirit dwells in you. And part of what His Spirit does is to convict us of unrighteousness. He brings us to the place where we look at our lives and we look at our soul and we look at his word and we say, you know what? What I say and what I do doesn't match up. God, please make me consistent. 
And not like the guy that had his thumbs, you know, make them both go that way, right? Make my hand like the other one. God doesn't make us consistent by making us all bad. He makes us consistent by carving out what doesn't honor him. And by creating in us the character and the image of Christ. That's the purpose for everything that he does, according to Romans 8, 29 through 30. It is to conform us to the image of Christ. It is his job, his joy, to make in us the person of Christ. This is because God boasts the glory of his eternal plan as Christ is formed in you. We read the passage in Ephesians 3 fairly frequently, so I'm just going to read the two verses that are most cogent to this argument. But he says, that everything that God does, he does to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as God succeeds in forming in you the character of Christ, you become his bragging point in the heavenly places. God looks at us and says, see my son being formed in my son. See my son being formed in my daughter. See my church reflect the glory of her Lord. And as he does that, he is displaying the perfection and the wisdom of his eternal plan, which, if you haven't figured it out yet, is every broken thing that the world has ever thrown at us. It is part of his eternal plan. And it is all purposed to display Christ in us and to magnify his glory in this moment and in eternity, even now in the heavenly places. This is the plan of a God who is worthy of the name. You see, the character of Christ is the goal of our lives. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 11, says, You, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you also were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you, in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Christ's appearing. Look, here's the reality. When we're in the midst of the fight, the fight is in the midst of us, and it changes us. The fight itself changes us. It makes us who we were not. And it makes us who God calls us to be. Look again at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and starting at verse 5. There's too much to get through. 2 Peter chapter 1 starting at verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For who he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me ask you a question. Where does the power come from to transform a life? It comes from God. It comes from His power. It comes from His hand. Now here's the hard question, though. What vehicle does He often use to transform a life? Difficulties, right? Trials, hardships. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13. Paul's wrapping up this letter to this church. He says this starting at verse 1. Now this is the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I've told you before, and foretell as if I were present the second time, and now being absent, I write to you who have sinned before, and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you are a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, 
For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. So we also are weak in him, but we live with him by the power of God toward you. Verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. When you have that conversation with your own soul, and you're forced to ask the question, do I even belong to God? You look at your sin, you look at your difficulty, am I even his? Well, but coming through that conversation leaves you empowered. But I promise you, it's not a pleasant evening. It's not a walk in the park, although you may be walking in the park when it comes to bear. It, it is not something that, that is going to be quickly forgotten. And it's something that we as followers of Christ must be willing to engage with, to actually examine our souls and to look at ourselves and to recognize the difficulty and the trials that are in our lives right now, putting pressure on the places that God wants to change. Look, here's the truth. If you belong to him and you start asking these questions, he's not going to throw you away because, oh, you dare to challenge my word. I've heard pastors say such things. You've said the prayer. You are his. Don't ever ask. Don't ever question. You'll offend God and you might not ever be his now. No, that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, question, reason, examine, search yourself out. Make sure that you're his. Why? Not because he's fickle, but we are, aren't we? And if you're not steady, certain, steadfast, sure, if you do not have the assurance of the Spirit dwelling in you, pressing into your soul, then what's going to happen when you're pushed? i got nothing. I'm going to crumble. I'm going to fall down because I'm scared of you and I'm scared I'm not His, so I have no place to stand. Beloved, we have to enter this. We have to anchor it through the trials and through the difficulties, and we have to understand that no matter what happens, it is God's work to save a people. It is God's work to do everything that he has set himself to do. And we have to also understand that the, the difficulty is real. Okay, let, let's bring it back into the conversation of the writer of Hebrews and what he's addressing to the Hebrew believers. He's talking about them throwing away their entire tradition that was indeed given to them by God. Amen? We cannot undo 1,500 years of God-given commands to Israel about how they were to live and how they were to worship and how they were to obey. And we cannot just poo-poo it away and say, oh, it's not a big deal. This was a huge deal. And we need to understand that sometimes when we're bringing the truth to the world, it is every bit as huge. I mentioned last week that, that when people tell you, well, I don't believe that, this is what I think, they're not lying to you. They're lying to themselves. They're telling you the absolute truth of what they believe to be true. It doesn't make them right, but it does make them honest. And we have to negotiate that difficulty. We have to understand that these things are real. Israel had been commanded to abide in the law lest they be struck with a curse. Do you understand those were the last words God spoke in Malachi? The very last thing before the 400 years of silence came, God said these words. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And then he quit speaking. So now comes this Jesus guy and all of his followers who say that the whole Old Testament has been completed and finished and let's jettison the works. Do you think that's an easy conversation? No. It's part of why the writer of Hebrews gets so absolutely determined to make his point. He's overcoming all of this tradition and all of this fear and all of these things that they knew to be true. And beloved, when you're carrying the gospel to somebody, you have to understand you're dealing with very real fears and very real confusion and very real things that they actually believe are to be true. They're not, they're not true. They're not right. But they believe them to be true. 
And you have to deal with that. And you have to acknowledge that. You have to balance out this idea of, of confessing the truth and understanding that everything else that's going on comes to us through the will and the word and the purpose of God. It's why being prayed up is so important when we're contending for truth. It's why making sure that you bathe yourself and them in prayer before you ever open your mouth is absolutely essential to everything that we're doing. And it should be the constant labor of our hearts and the constant labor of our lives to be lifting up the lost in prayer, to be looking for opportunities to declare the word of Christ and to see his name magnified, first in us and then unto them. Our job is to proclaim this. And in the end, we have to be loyal to God and to God alone because God always brings us back to the ground of the cross. Do you want to know what is the dividing mark between truth and lies when it comes to how a man is saved? It is the centrality of the death of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Look, Paul was a Jew of Jews. He was a studied lawyer. He understood more about the law than most people would ever know. He'd forgotten more about the law than most people would ever know. But that is not what he proclaimed. He did not proclaim their lies back to them. He did not proclaim their misunderstandings back to them. He did not declare old truth. He declared the truth of Jesus Christ. And he said, I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. We should be a, a song of one note. That's all we have. We have Christ and him crucified. Why does this matter? It's because God is the only mover in our salvation. You want to try and get saved on your own strength? Good luck. You want to try and make yourself worthy? Good luck. You want to try and somehow convince yourself to love what you hate and hate what you love? Good luck. Look, the Bible tells us that apart from the merciful pulling of God, apart from God's hand calling the dead to life, we all hate him. This makes us beggars of grace. And I'm okay with that because I serve a God who is so full of grace, he always answers yes. When I beg for grace, his answer to me is always yes. When I cry for mercy, his answer to me is always yes. And it's not because of me, it's because of him. We have to stay loyal to him because he is all we have. Which means you can't stand in the middle. You understand that? You can't have a foot in both worlds. You can't stand in between the truth that the world perceives and the truth that God declares. You must be clear, you must be plain, you must be determined, you must be committed that what God has said is the only thing that is. It's all we have. And the writer of Hebrews keeps coming back to this argument that he's making about Christ being superior because it's all that matters. And he's not willing to get sidetracked on all the other things until he settles the ground of Christ and Christ alone. We can take a page or three from his book and do quite well. Do not get distracted on the side issues. Look, you want to go speak to somebody who's lost in some terrible sin. You want to go talk to somebody that's left his wife. You want to go talk to somebody that's, that's lost in homosexuality or absolute gender confusion and all the strange things that come out of sin. You want to do that? Don't address those issues. Speak truth if they come up. But what they need to hear is Christ and Christ crucified. Declare the truth of who he is. God will take care of the sin. Repentance is required. Please don't mishear me. You need to urge them to repent. But you don't tell them, look, get cleaned up and then come to church. You don't tell them, look, sort out these things in your life and then God will be happy enough to save you. That's not how it works. We declare Christ. We declare him crucified. We declare him raised. We declare justification through his blood. And when they fall on their face before a holy God and cry for mercy, he will save them and then he will deliver them. That's our job. 
That's our calling. That is what we are supposed to be proclaiming to a lost and dying world. God is the ordainer and the fulfiller of all that he has purposed to accomplish in Christ. Look again at Ephesians chapter 1. Starting at verse 3, we know this passage well. It's so glorious. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This is God's doing, not ours. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. This is not because we were good. It is not because we were holy. It's not because we avoided those terrible sins that those wicked people do. It's because God chose us. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not ours. Nothing to do with us. His will in his will alone. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. What's his motivation? The declaration of his grace and his love and his character and his nature to all men. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. You want to know why you're facing what you're facing? Because God ordained it to the praise of his glory. You want to know why you're having difficult conversations with people that you love? It is because God has ordained it to the praise of his glory. He has chosen you, his appointed vessel, for this time and this place and this moment. And you have an obligation to be loyal to God and to no other. To proclaim his truth regardless of how they feel about it. And even, beloved, catch this, regardless of how you might feel about it at the moment. We have an obligation because our God deserves our loyalty. He deserves our praise because he has revealed himself and his purposes in his word. And he will never speak in any manner that is contrary to that revelation. He has shown us who he is consistently, faithfully, over and over and over again. And he will never change his mind about who he is and never change his mind about what he has done. His plan of salvation, his revealed will, has always been pointed to the cross of Christ. And it is there that we will always land. There is nothing else. There's no self-help thing that's going to change the world. There's no 12-step program that's going to alter anybody's life in any way that matters. There is nothing that is going to fix the problems of the world but the cross of Christ. And if we don't understand that, we of all people, if we don't understand that, then who can? This is our calling. This is our job. This is our responsibility. Galatians 6.14 says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. God forbid that I should boast in anything else. God forbid that I should delight in anything else as much as I delight in him. I love my wife. I love my family. All five of my children, even the obnoxious little three-year-old, I love them all. He is obnoxious. You know he is. You took him out of here three times today. He's obnoxious. He's in space lately. I love them all. But beloved, understand this. I love God more. And you have to. Because for me to love them more than I love him would be idolatry. For me to declare my faithfulness to anything or anybody above Christ is idolatrous. God forbid that I should boast in anything except him. And that is what conforms us in the end to his image above all things. 
Because here's the secret you may not know. You start to look like the ones that you spend the most time with. You start to look like the one that you gaze upon. You start to bear the image of the image maker. And when that starts to happen, there is no limit to how God will use you. And there's also no limit to how the enemy might attack you, except those limits that are set by your father. So fear not, for your God is the one who is on the throne. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give to us wisdom and grace and knowledge. And I pray, Lord, that in the midst of this day, all of these things might be consolidated into the simple truth that we are called to love you more than any and called to obey you more than all. And God, help us walk in such a way that the grace of Christ defines and shapes and guides us. God, let our lives reflect your glory so that the cross of Christ is held high. Father, we pray these things in part because we love our friends and neighbors and our family that are lost. But the core of our desire, Father, is that the Lamb who was slain would receive the full reward of his infinite suffering. God, he bore wrath on our account. And he deserves to be exalted. Let every knee bow and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord. And let us do it with joy that he might receive that reward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.